Hi and welcome to the last Intagma tutorial of Season 2. Today I talk about curve framing. Curve framing is constructing a matrix for every point of the curve and thus defining an orientation on every point of the curve. That is useful, for example, if you use the curve as a trajectory for a camera, or if you want to clone objects onto the curve and have their orientation very smoothly. It's not totally trivial to construct such orientations, because the only thing you really have on a curve is the tangent vector. You can find this one if you happen to know the formula of the curve by using the first derivative, or you can just use the line segments if you are using a linear curve. But other than that, it's hard to figure out the orientation. Several algorithms have been proposed to find a solution to this problem, and one of them is parallel transport. And this one is the algorithm we are trying to implement today. This paper here, from 1995, by Hansen and Ma, is presenting the algorithm. If you are starting to read through this document, you see a lot of mathematical formulas and weird symbols. It's not totally easy to understand, but fortunately, the authors are giving us the algorithm in pseudocode here. So we can just implement what we find here. But first I want to explain the principle of the algorithm. So let's think about what we are trying to achieve. Let's say we have a curve. This curve is constructed from points. And what we want to do is we want to define a matrix or a frame in every point that defines the orientation of the curve. First, this frame should orient itself along the curve. So we can use a tangent vector, because the tangent vector always points along the curve. And then we want to find a second vector that sits orthogonal to this tangent vector that defines the torsion of the curve. And what is the torsion? The torsion is the winding of the curve. So imagine you are putting cubes on every point of the curve. It's really the rotation around the tangent that makes up the torsion. So if I have here a segment of the curve, this is a tangent vector, then it makes a big difference if I construct a normal vector like this, that is orthogonal, or if I have a plane of rotation here along this vector, or if I define it like this with a different angle, or like this. This really determines how stuff winds around the curve. The algorithm in the paper tries to find a solution where the torsion varies smoothly. So we have these tangent vectors here, and parallel transport will find a vector, let's put this in green, a normal vector that varies smoothly along this curve here. So the difference between the individual normals that the algorithm will find is minimal from one normal to the next. So we have no abrupt changes in orientation or in rotation around the tangent, but we will have a smoothly varying normal. And if we have these two vectors, the tangent vector and the normal vector, we can easily construct a third vector by just using the cross product. It's called the bitangent or the binormal, really depends on the paper. And thus we create a matrix, a orthonormal frame that we can use to define an orientation and to put stuff on the curve or to use it as a trajectory or to use it to construct geometry, to do a hull, a tube around the curve or something like this. And we have full control over the orientations. So how does the algorithm work? So let's see what the paper is telling us. Say we have this curve here, and it has points, first point, second point, third point, and so on. Let's number these. So this is point zero, one, two, three, four, five. Now, as an input, this algorithm expects a list of unit tangent vectors, ti. t hat means that this is a vector that is normalized. It has unit length, length 1. And this subscript i means it's the tangent of point i, for all i between 0 and n, with n being the number of points. So for all points we have a tangent vector in a list. Let's draw these. So we have a tangent for point 0, and a tangent for point 1, and a tangent for point 2, and for point 3, and so on. Like so tangents. All of these have length 1. 
Next, we need an initial normal vector, v0. So this is a vector that is not normalized, or can be normalized, but doesn't have to, and it sits in point 0. And it should be orthogonal to t0. So we choose a normal vector that is orthogonal to t0. But this normal vector can have any orientation around this tangent here. And that is the trick of the algorithm. This algorithm will take this initial normal vector and will move it from point to point and will rotate it such that it is orthogonal to the next tangent with minimal rotation. So it will only rotate it as much as necessary to make it orthogonal to the next tangent. And thus this normal vector will vary smoothly along the curve. That is a very nice thing. If we give this to the algorithm, the algorithm will output a list of parallel transported normal vectors, vi, for all the points between 1 and n, because the normal for 0 we already chose. And all these normals will be orthogonal to their tangents. That is what this statement here says. Okay, great. So how does the algorithm work? The first statement here for i0 to n minus 1, step 1, just means loop through all the points. Do a loop for all the points. And then do stuff for all the points. The first thing that is actually computed is b. b is a vector, a temporary bitangent. Let's draw b. And b is constructed by doing a cross product between t ti and ti plus 1. What does that mean? Well, ti is the tangent of the currently processed point, in our case 0. And ti plus 1 is just the next tangent. So we do a cross product between the first tangent and the next tangent. What is this? Well, if we take this second tangent here and put it here temporarily, like so, these two vectors will span a plane. And if you remember how the cross product works, the cross product gives us the vector that is orthogonal to this plane. So something like this. This is B, our temporary bi tangent. Now that we have this, we can check if the length of b is zero. And when will this be the case? This is exactly then the case if these two initial vectors, so ti and ti plus 1, the tangent and the next tangent, are exactly the same vector. Then the cross product will return zero. And in this case, we just copy our current normal to the next normal. And that is valid because if the line is just straight, in which case the tangents are identical, the normal should be the same. So that is great. But what if this is not the case? So this is this else here. In this case, we first normalize this temporary bitangent, and then we do this. Theta is arc cosinus of our current tangent and the next tangent. What is this? Well, it's just using the dot product to calculate the angle between these two vectors. So this statement here is saying we are calculating this angle here and this angle is theta. And we want to have this angle because now we want to rotate this normal to put it onto the next tangent. And this is written here. So vi plus 1, the next normal, should be r, and r is a rotational matrix, it's a little bit unfortunate that in this document here all the vectors are capital letters. Normally capital letters are reserved for matrices and bold small letters are used for vectors, but they decided to use capital letters for both. So R is a matrix and B is our bitangent. So what we want to do is we want to construct a rotation matrix that rotates by theta around our temporary binormal. And this rotation matrix is applied to our initial normal, vi. If you multiply a matrix by a vector, you apply the transformation encoded by the matrix to the vector. So what this is telling us is, now that we have this angle theta, we are just taking our initial normal and we are rotating it by theta. So we are rotating it 
by this angle here to create something like this and put it here. And by, the, by doing this rotation, we transported this initial normal to the next point. And you see, it's still orthogonal. And then, and if, and for. And now, do the same thing again for the next point. So again, take the two tangents, current tangent and the next tangent, form this plane, create this temporary bitangent, and then rotate this normal. And if you do that, you will find that this vector will always be orthogonal to the tangent. And it is transported, because it's always the same vector, just rotated piecewise, so step by step along the curve. And this gives a smoothly varying normal. Great, so let's jump into Houdini and implement this. As we are this time only interested in implementing this algorithm, I already prepared a scene with all the other stuff for you. Here inside this parallel transport node, you will find this file node importing this object here. It's just too bold Tori to show the orientation of the first one. I put this second one on top. And then I have a curve. Here is the curve. And now I want to do the curve framing for this curve and then copy these objects onto the curve to see the result. I created some visualizers beforehand. If you go here, you see I created a vector visualizer for PT tangent, PT normal and PT bitangent, because these three names are the attribute names I intend to use in the operator. And these allow me to see the vectors directly in the viewport. Great, so put down a wrinkle, in our case a primitive wrinkle, because we want to run over all the primitives. We want to do the algorithm for every primitive in the input geometry. In our case, we only have one primitive. If I turn on primitive numbers, you see I have primitive zero. But if we happen to have more primitives, this wrangle will run over all of them and do the stuff for all the primitives. Now connect this to the first input and call this parallel transport. Press Alt-E to open the code editor. And now let's implement this. I won't implement this in a very efficient manner. I will implement it to be as easy to grasp as possible. So of course you can make this faster and more elegant, but bear with me because it's easier to understand the way I code it. Okay, so first of all, we want to have all the points. So in points, PNTS, which is an array, should give me all the points. And I want all the points that are in the primitive currently processed. So prim points is my friend, because prim points gives me all the points that belong to the primitive. Geometry stream is zero, and add prim num will give me the currently processed primitive number. This gives me all the primitive points. And we need the point count, because we later on want to loop over all the points. So int point count is just the length of this array. Len PNTS. This is our point count. Now remember that we need the very first tangent and the very first normal. Because we want to create a normal that is orthogonal to the very first tangent. So let's create a vector and name it first tangent. And how can we compute it? Well, as we are dealing with a linear spline, I used a resample, so it's just a sequence of line segments. We can just use the first and second point and use the line between them. So it's point, because we are, remember that we are in a primitive wrangle, so we have to use a point function to find point positions. So point geometry stream zero, and we are interested in the position P, and then PNTS and square brackets one. That is the first point in the point array. Minus the zeros point, so the current point point, geometry stream zero, again p for position, and then p and t s and brackets zero. 
But as we are trying to find the tangent, we want to normalize this. So put everything in brackets and normalize it. So that gives the very first tangent vector. And now for the very first normal vector, vector, first normal, and remember that we just make this one up. So let's say it will be 0, 1, 0. But this first normal here is not orthogonal to our tangent, because our tangent lies somewhere in space, and we are just using global y up as a first normal. So we have to make it orthogonal before we start. So let's do that. Create another vector, vector helper, and let's do a cross product, cross product between first normal and first tangent. This will give us a helper vector. And then we do a second cross product and write the result to first normal. It will be the cross product of first tangent and this helper vector. So by doing this, and don't forget the semicolon here and here, by doing this we are taking our vector, then calculating an orthogonal helper vector and crossing this with a tangent, which gives us the original vector but altered that way that it sits orthogonal on the first tangent. And as we are doing cross products here, it's always a good idea to normalize the result. So normalize the normal vector or the helper vector and normalize this new first normal vector. Like so. Let's press apply and accept and makes this visible, and here's our first error. Let's quickly see what's going on here. Just a typo, first normal. Now we have no errors anymore. Great, so now we constructed a vector that is orthogonal to the first tangent. Now I want to define some variables that I use later on in the loop inside of if statements. I call these, let's quickly add a comment forward declarations. So I will need a vector called by tangent. Initialize this to be 0, 0, 0. That will be used later. And then I want to initialize or create a float theta for the angle, initialize it to 0. And then we need the arrays to hold the tangents and the normals. So vector, tangents, and then where brackets, indicating this is an array, should be nothing at the moment, just an empty vector. And vector normals, again an array, should be nothing too, like so. So now we have all the variables that we need later on. Now for the loop, let's say we first want to fill the arrays. So fill arrays. Let's loop over all the points and put stuff into the arrays. Let's create a for loop, for, counting variable is int i, should be zero. As long as i is smaller than point count, minus one and i++ plus plus is the increment. Why point count minus one? Well, I intend to calculate the tangents as I did with the very first tangent. So I want to take the next point and subtract um, the next point from the current point. But for the very last point of my spline, I don't have the next point. So I skip the very last point here in this calculation, because this will give me an error, because I don't have a next point. So we'll care about the very last point later. For now, let's run over all the points, but the very last point. So curly braces, 
everything inside this code block will be executed for all the points but the very last point. So let's uh, write the tangents. Push. Push will just put a new value or append a new value to the array. We want to append values to the tangents array. So push to the tangents array. And now we want to push the tangent. And we can calculate the tangent exactly as we did before here. It's just that we have to change the points that are computed. We don't want to use point 1 and point 0, but we want to use the next point and the current point. Point 1 will be i plus 1. This is the next point, because i is the current point, and plus 1, we have the index of the next point. And this here is replaced by i. So now we compute the tangent vector, like we did before, but for all the points. And then we need another bracket here, because we opened one with push and a semicolon. Now we are computing a tangent for every point and putting the, the result into the tangents array. And then push. Now for the normals array. First normal. We are intending to compute these normals, so from now we can just put the first normal in there, because we will overwrite these normals later. Now that this loop finished, we have values for all the points but the last one. So it's time to set values for last point. And that will be push, to just push one other value to the tangents array. And it will be tangents, point count, minus two, bracket, semicolon. This will just read the last value of the array, so the value of the point before the last point, and copy it to the last point, because we are just reusing the last valid value for the last point. And let's do the same thing for the normals array, so push, normals, and then normals, and point count minus two, like so. Let's press apply and accept and see if we have any errors. No, we don't have errors so far. So now, after this step, we have two arrays filled with values. The tangent, arrays, uh, the tangent array really holds the tangents, and the normal array is filled with the initial normal, just to have values in there. And we will override these values later. Now comes the parallel transport. But before we use this, let's do one debug step. Let's set the tangents and visualize them in the viewport to see if everything works so far. So set attributes. And remember that you cannot use the add syntax here because we are using a primitive wrangle. So we are operating on the primitives. If you want to set point values, you have to use set point attribute. Say set point attrib, geometry stream is zero. And the attribute we want to set is pt tangent, because this is the value we computed so far, for points. And now we need a loop, because we want to set the value for all the points. So let's put this statement into a loop quickly. For integer j in this case, because it's the second loop, is zero. Now j is smaller than point count, because now we want to run over all the points, including the last one, j++. Now another bracket here, like so. And now it's time to finish this, so points j, because this is the number of the point that we want to write the attribute to. And we want to write the attribute to all the points, so we, are, we created a second loop running over all the points, and we write to the current point of this second loop, so p and t s j. And what we want to write is the value from the tangents array, so tangents, and again j, like so. Now we are reading the value with an index j from the tangents array and write it to the point j. And don't forget to say that Houdini has to set the value semicolon, and press apply, and accept.
Now go to the visualizers and click PT Tangent. Little display bug here. I always have to go to the geometry spreadsheet and back again to see the values. I don't know why, but it works beautifully. So here you have all the tangent vectors for our points. Here are the points and the blue tangent vectors that we calculated and wrote to the array and then wrote to the points as an attribute. So far we only did preparation. So now let's compute something new, something useful. The parallel transport. And here I will create my third for loop. That of course is not very efficient, as I mentioned earlier. You would consolidate these for loops into one or two instead of three, but uh, it's easier to do it that way because then we can exactly mimic what we have in the paper. For clarity purposes, let's create a third for loop. For int k is zero, k is smaller than point count, minus one, and k plus plus. And again, I'm running over all the points but the last point, but in this case, this has a different reason. The algorithm tells me that I have to write to the next point. So the values that I calculate are always for the next one. That's why I am running over all the points but the last one, because I will write to the last one in the last minus one. Okay. So first let's create this temporary bitangent. I use the bitangent variable for this. I will reuse it later, but why creating a new variable if I have this already? So bitangent is a cross product, the cross product be be between the two tangents, the current tangent and the next tangent. So tangents and then the current tangent current is tangent k and tangents k plus 1. The next tangent, like so. This is our temporary bitangent vector. And now we have to check if the length of this calculated vector is zero. So length bitangent is zero. And if this is the case, then we want to just copy the normal. So normals and then k plus one is normals k. And here you have the reason for the loop not running over the last point. I'm writing to k plus one, so to one point ahead. But what if this bitangent is not length zero? Else. And now comes what we went over a second ago. Bitangent has to be normalized. Like so. And then we want to compute theta that we already created and initialized with the arcus cosinus of the dot product of the current tangent and the next tangent. K plus one, close bracket, close bracket, semicolon. So this gives the angle between the two tangent vectors. And now we need a matrix. So define a matrix, rot, Mat, and initialize this matrix with ident, which just gives the identity matrix, just to have a matrix. Because now we can use a convenience function called rotate, which will just set up a matrix in a way that it rotates around a specified vector and a specified angle. So rot mat, the angle is theta, and the axis is by tangent. After this step, we now have a rotation matrix that rotates theta radians around by tangent, which is great, because what we now can do is normals 
k plus 1. So the next normal should be this rotation matrix applied to the current normal k, like so. Let's get rid of these extra spaces here. And now we implemented exactly the algorithm that we found in the paper. Exactly like they wrote it in pseudocode, we now transferred it to VEX. We did the preparation in such a way that we could write the code exactly the way they did. Let's check if we have any errors. Does not look as if we have errors. So now what's missing is that we write the results back to the geometry. Another set point attribute. We can just use the loop that we already created, geometry stream zero, and now we want to write pt normal. And this will be points j and normal, normals j. So I want to write to point j the value that I find in the j's index of the normals array and set. And in a second we will see if this worked or not. I have a typo here, so apply and accept. And if I now turn on the PT normal visualizer and do this trick here with turning this off and on again, you see here you have the parallel transported normals. And it looks as if the algorithm is doing a beautiful job, because these vectors are orthogonal to the tangents everywhere, and they are varying smoothly. That is exactly what we were after. But one last thing is missing, because we need a third vector to form a matrix. That third vector is the actual bitangent. So open the code editor once again, and the good thing is that this bitangent can easily be computed from just these vectors. So bitangent. And now it's a bitangent that we actually want to use. So we just override whatever is stored in this variable from the loop before with normalize and then cross. And let's just cross normals j the value we just wrote a second ago, and tangents j. Now we just created a new bitangent vector by crossing the other two. And as these two are orthogonal, this one will be orthogonal too. And now set it, set point, attrib, geometry stream zero, this time it is pt by tangent, the point to set to is points j, and the value is by tangent, like so. Oh, and don't forget, I always mention this, and then I forget it myself, set to tell Houdini to set this value. Apply, accept, and turn on the visualizer, Turn off, turn on, and here you have the, the matrices. Here you have them. Great, now we have orthogonal vectors. But remember that we intended to copy the object we imported to this curve, and we wanted to use these orientations for the orientation of these objects, and that is not possible using three vectors. We have to convert them into an orient attribute. And the orient attribute is a quaternion. So let's use a VOP, a point VOP, to convert these vectors to a quaternion. Let's call this create orient and dive inside, make it visible and dive inside. First let's bind the vectors we just calculated. So bind and then this will be a vector quantity, pt, tangent. Let's just copy this with alt and call the next one pt normal 
and then repeat the process and call this one pt by tangent like so these are our three vectors and the order is very important because we want the tangent to be the z axis the bitangent to be the x-axis and the normal to be the y-axis of our local coordinate frame. So now create a vector to matrix and just connect the three individual vectors. This way we create a rotation matrix out of three vectors. And then let's create a matrix to quaternion matrix 3 to quaternion to just convert from matrix to quaternion and then export this as orient so bind export and this will be a vector 4 because it's a quaternion call it orient and connect it this way our geometry now has an orient attribute if you go to the geometry spreadsheet scroll to the right you will see that we have this orient here. And now we can put down a copy to points and connect our object, connect our template point attributes, turn off the visualizer and the point display and you see it's working beautifully. Our objects are duplicated on the curve, but the orientation is totally smooth it's oriented along the spline, but at the same time, these bulges here are varying smoothly. So this is the implementation of the parallel transport algorithm. It's a very useful algorithm that is used in a lot of cases. The sweep node inside of Houdini uses it, for example, and you can use it for many things too. So maybe as a exercise try to make this node more efficient by consolidating the loops and implement this as a digital asset because I'm pretty sure that you will have uses for this in the future. So thank you very much for following me through this hard VEX lesson. I um, hope you learned how to implement a paper, how to dig through the mathematical formulas, how to understand what the paper is actually telling you and how to implement this inside of Houdini. That's a very useful skill to learn. Thanks again and stay with us. We will be back in two months. As always, a very, very big thank you to all our patrons, especially Mohamed Alabri, Momomija Ichigo and David Adan.